Welcome to CUNY Laureates, the show about CUNY graduates who went on to win major awards in their respective fields. On this episode, we profile another three MacArthur Fellows from the City University of New York. First, we hear about Eric Wolf's lifelong effort to transcend the boundaries of culture and society with his innovative application of Marxist concepts to the field of anthropology. Then, upon Osorio's ornate art installations, transport the public into communities and art spaces deeply influenced by his Puerto Rican heritage. Finally, we learn how Paul Marshall's upbringing among brownstones in Brooklyn shaped her career as a writer. Academics strive tirelessly to explain the world around us in a categorical manner. In some instances, the task is a little easier. Chemists study distinct molecules. Physicists study predictable actions and reactions. But what about the study of people? Is it possible to think about societies and cultures empirically? Eric Wolf thought so. But he also thought we might all be going about it the wrong way. This is the story of a CUNY graduate who became a MacArthur Fellow and his quest to reimagine the field of anthropology. Eric Wolf, the Lehman College and CUNY Graduate Center professor and graduate of Queens College, was a bit of a rock star in the anthropological community. Or he was, at least, to the throngs of leftist students from around the country and world who flocked to his courses, attracted by his particular application of Marxist ideas to the study of anthropology. But Eric himself, who intentionally used the term Marxian rather than Marxist in his writing, was less interested in Marxism as a political project and more as a way of explaining how human relationships and social labor might drive the development of societies and cultures. The diversity and interaction of societies was a lifelong source of fascination for Eric, beginning with the stories he would hear about his own family history. His parents had met in Siberia, where his father, an Austrian, had been sent as a prisoner of war in World War I, and his maternal grandfather, a Russian, had been forcefully resettled after a brief self-exile in France. Eric himself grew up among the ethnic and class diversity of Vienna, where he was born in 1923, and in the Sudetenland, a German-Czech border region where his father had been sent to run a factory 10 years later. But it wasn't just this mixing of cultures that impressed upon Eric. His own Jewish identity amidst the rising anti-Semitism of Europe made him keenly aware of the often life or death stakes and how people see themselves and one another. In 1938, on the eve of Nazi Germany's takeover of the Sudetenland, Eric was sent to England, followed by the rest of his family soon after but escaping the Nazis didn't get rid of Eric's label as other. In 1940, he was incarcerated in a British detention camp for enemy aliens, a group that consisted of a few Nazis and a whole lot of the Europeans who had fled them. Out of this crucible of an adolescence, Eric was able to leave England for the United States in 1940, where his family settled in Jackson Heights, New York, and where Eric promptly enrolled in the tuition-free Queen's College. His experiences in Europe had him asking some of life's big questions, and he initially looked to biochemistry in the hope of finding some answers. There was just one problem. I got terribly bored with it, Eric said in a 1987 interview. My experiments were always coming out wrong. Now at a loss for what to study, Eric dabbled in political science and economics, before coming across an anthropology course about Asia. The course topics range from the caste system of India to the history of Chinese writing, and Eric realized that anthropology was a discipline that could tackle everything he was truly interested in about the human experience. But a degree would have to wait. World War II came to America, and Eric deferred his education for three years to fight with the U.S. Army in the Italian Alps. He was back in Europe again, facing an old enemy, the experience affected him deeply and stirred him out of any remaining academic listlessness. It allowed me to put some things in perspective, he told the American ethnologist in 1987. 
People came back from the war with an enormous sense that there was a new world and that you could still possibly do something new and more hopeful. Driven by this new feeling of possibility, Eric finished his studies at Queen's College and graduated with a degree in anthropology in 1946. <music> Under the GI Bill, Eric was able to enroll in a graduate program at Columbia University. Columbia's anthropology department had been founded by Franz Boas, a scientist often called the father of American anthropology, and it had become the preeminent department in the country. Boas popularized the concepts of cultural relativism and historical particularism, ideas that emphasized each society's unique past and rejected the notion that there was any shared path in how they evolved. But when Eric arrived, he and a like-minded group of left-leaning students became much more interested in how larger social forces might affect and connect different societies. They felt that Marxist theories regarding how human beings work, produce, and relate to one another could offer some insight. Together, a number of them formed a group that they called the Mundial Upheaval Society, where they could exchange ideas. We were veterans and therefore slightly different and somewhat standoffish towards the rest of the student population, Eric later explained. And we all had some kind of socialist sympathies. And I think we saw anthropology and that kind of socialist concern as having some connection with each other. Eric received his doctorate in 1951, and over the next 20 years, taught anthropology in a number of different schools. During this time, he also took several research trips to Mexico, culminating in his 1959 book, Sons of the Shaking Earth, where, using Mexico as an example, he began to lay out his view of societies as dynamic, responsive systems that would change and reorganize internally over time. In 1971, Eric Wolf became a distinguished professor at Lehman College and the CUNY Graduate Center. It was at CUNY where Eric's views on anthropology came together in his most well-known book, Europe and the People Without History. In it, he laid out his criticism of the idea that societies could be studied as isolated entities, whose true nature would be discerned by looking for some original, untouched state. Instead, Eric argued that all societies are interconnected, in a constant state of interaction and internal reorganization, and that these processes must be the focus of anthropology. It was in the study of these processes where Eric believed Marxism could be utilized. Different systems of production, such as capitalism or feudalism, would produce groups and classes that would align or compete with one another in response to their regional or historical circumstances. These were the so-called people without history, colonized peoples, peasants, laborers, whose contributions to history had long been ignored, but were just as important as the actions of the powerful. Eric's take on the dynamic nature of cultures and his provocative use of Marx to analyze that dynamism turned a lot of heads and made him a household name in anthropological circles. And his assertion of the historical agency of colonized peoples resonated greatly with the students who came from many of those same parts of the world. In 1990, Eric Wolf was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship. With the money from the award, he retired from CUNY in 1992 and turned his focus to a new project, one that would link together all of his professional and personal experience, the study of power. In his final book, Envisioning Power, Ideologies of Dominance and Crisis, published in 1999, Eric attempted to explain how power, culture, and ideas relate to one another. To do so, he compared three different societies, the Coacutl of the Pacific Northwest, the Aztecs of Mexico, and the Nazi regime of Germany. In each case, Eric identified a state of increasing stress that led to extreme ideologies. These ideologies, which concerned cosmic ideas of order and truth, were formed out of cultural elements familiar to each society, but ultimately served to maintain and justify the respective systems of power and production. With his last work, Eric Wolf incorporated the cultural dynamism he had studied throughout the colonial world, the modes of production he adapted from Marx, and his own visceral experience facing Nazi terror as a youth to offer a grand theory of how culture and power relate. In a passage from his final book, Eric Wolf offered this warning. He wrote, 
If culture was conceived originally as an entity with fixed boundaries marking off insiders against outsiders, we need to ask who set these borders and who now guards the ramparts. Eric's lifelong quest was to better understand humanity, and in that quest, he helped all of us to see across those borders a bit more clearly. Our next genius is an installation artist whose pieces draw new meaning out of common objects and pop culture. This is a story of a CUNY graduate who became a MacArthur Fellow and his unique exploration of community and belonging through art. Papon Osorio was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico and moved to New York City in 1975 when he was still young, settling in the South Bronx. When I moved to New York specifically, what I call is the Republic of the South Bronx. I mean, I'm an immigrant, definitely. I mean, I went through the process of learning the language, I went through the process of learning the culture. Before his art practice took shape, Osorio earned a sociology degree from Lehman College and then worked as a social worker in the child abuse prevention program in the South Bronx. He earned a master's in sociology from Columbia University. In his early years, his art focused on ornate, sculptured objects, deeply informed by Puerto Rican heritage, talking about history, stereotypes, objects, and much of his artwork drew direct inspiration from conversations he had in the community. So what I was doing was collecting stories, collecting experiences, collecting the memory of what it was to be with all those families, and then translating them into an installation. And I also saw myself not bearing the responsibility of a caseworker, but that of an artist, trying to figure it a way to allow myself and, and the people that I work with to step back and look at the situation. I'm always interested in working with people that have no clue what traditional or contemporary or, for that matter, institutional art it's all about. In 2023, the new museum mounted a survey of the work of Papon Osorio. The work ranged from small sculptural pieces to the large installations for which he is perhaps most known. It's actually quite an honor to be able to show all of these works together for the first time because he has worked in these very site-specific uh, situations. You enter many different universes, almost like a maze or a, an experience in each one of them, you know, one after the other, is something that's very new. I think Pepon is an artist driven by a sense of responsibility, always trying to reach a certain degree of justice in relation to the communities um, that he's working with. Issues related to race, gender, social class in the United States, and all these issues, they are embedded very deeply in the formation of these works. Margot Norton and Bernardo Muschiera curated the show in collaboration with Osorio. They recognize the dual nature of his work, that it belongs both in the community and in the institutional space of a museum. The works definitely do change when they're seen inside of the community versus when they're inside of the museum because there's, in so many of these installations, there's times where I feel personally like I'm transported. They're almost like portals and I become inside of a totally different space that I almost forget where I am. His work has almost always been maximalist in its approach. He really does embrace that wholeheartedly, this idea of a maximalist aesthetic, right? So he's taking a kind of aesthetics that's not typically valued in institutional spaces, but he's going even deeper within it to make a specific statement about what is valued or not valued. Osorio's first major installation was called Scene of the Crime. The work spoke to issues of Hispanic identity and Hollywood stereotypes, with a focus on the film Ford Apache the Bronx, a movie protested by Latinos at the time for perpetuating a violent stereotype. What I really was going for was basically the reality of how we lived and how we were portrayed by the Hollywood film industry at that time. Scene of a crime, which is basically the killing of a stereotype. 
This piece was installed at the Whitney, but for his next major work, No Crying in the Barbershop from 1994, Osorio wanted his art to have a direct impact on the community, and so the piece was installed in the community. The opening of the No Crying Allowed in the Barbershop, I brought together two groups of people that not normally talk to each other, which was the local people and the art people, and they both came together, converged in, in an opening. So little by little, I started to somehow create the, the reverse patterns that you see when you, when you look at art um, in museums. It's extremely important to me to bring the outsider inside. Even if I think that I'm an insider, I'm an outsider. No Crying in the Barbershop was first installed in a Puerto Rican neighborhood in Connecticut called Frog Hollow, and eventually led to his MacArthur Genius Grant, given a few years later in 1999. I think the idea of collaboration is really central in Pepon's work. Most part of his works and all his most important works were developed in collaboration with different communities, sometimes with one person, sometimes with a small group of people, sometimes with an entire community, as in the case of Reform, a work that he developed from 2014 to 2017, in which he collaborated literally with an entire community of students, former students, parents, teachers, former workers, who were all mourning the closing of this school in Philadelphia. I only work with communities that are very, very close. I've learned to become a passive voice. I come into the neighborhood, I create my presence, people see me, people become curious about who I am. I have conversations that are completely non-art related. They all have a way of making and approaching things that is different from each other. And I learned to listen to that, what I call the social architecture of communities. I learned to listen to that. And still, Osario works. His 2023 piece, Convalescences, shows an artist still at the height of his genius level powers. Glancing down the interminable Brooklyn street, you thought of those joined brownstones as one house reflected through a train of mirrors, with no walls between the houses, but only vast rooms, yawning endlessly, one into the other. Yet, looking close, you saw that under the thick ivy, each house had something distinctly its own. Some touch that was Gothic, Romanesque, Baroque, or Greek, triumphed amid the Victorian clutter. Here, ionic columns framed the windows while next door, gargoyles scowled up at the sun. There, the cornices were hung with carved foliage while gorgon heads decorated the others. Many houses had bay windows of Gothic stonework. A few boasted turrets raised high above the other roofs, yet they all shared the same brown monotony. All seemed doomed by the confusion in their design. Behind those Behind grim, those grim facades, facades, in those, those high, high rooms, rooms life, soared life soared and ebbed. ebbed. In her novel, Brown Girl Brownstones, author Paul Marshall used a typical Brooklyn brownstone as a symbol of her family's struggle to adapt to life in a new world, and in doing so, often an intimate look at the hopes and dreams of millions of West Indian immigrants living in the United States. This is the story of a CUNY graduate who became a MacArthur Fellow and her lifelong passion for writing. Born in 1929 as Valenza Pauline Burke to a family of Barbadian immigrants in Brooklyn, New York, Paul was expected to fit the mold and find practical means of sustaining her livelihood. After Paul's father decided to leave the family and join a religious cult in Harlem, her mother Ada was left with little understanding for her daughter's affinity for writing. 
Ironically, it was her mother's everyday conversations with other Bayesian housewives and mothers in the kitchen of their brownstone that initially inspired Paul to become a writer. I grew up around poets, she later recalled in her essay from The Poets in the Kitchen. They taught me my first lessons in the narrative art. They trained my ear. They set a standard of excellence. This is why the best of my work must be attributed to them. It stands as testimony to the rich legacy of language and culture they so freely pass on to me in the workshop of the kitchen. After being introduced to poet and novelist Paul Lawrence Dunbar and his exceptional ability to capture Southern black dialect as poetry, her thirst for the written word became unquenchable. Out of respect for her fellow writer, but also believing that her explicitly female name may hurt her prospects when applying for jobs in journalism, Pauline Marshall decided to drop the end of her given name and change it to a more masculine form, Paul. Suggestively, and most likely out of spite, she decided to keep the E silent as a potent reminder of her sacrifice. At the tender age of 13, however, she still wouldn't dare to consider herself a writer. At least, not under her mother's watch. In 1949, Paul enrolled in Hunter College with plans of becoming a social worker. Soon after, however, she contracted tuberculosis and spent a year recovering in a local sanatorium. As luck would have it, this unfortunate period of her life had a surprisingly positive outcome. The time spent at the sanatorium allowed her to immerse herself in books, and after recovering, she firmly decided to pursue a degree in English literature at Brooklyn College. It was here at Brooklyn College that she had her first taste of creative writing and started working on her first book, Brown Girl, Brownstones. In this semi-autobiographical novel published in 1959, a girl named Selena lives with her Barbadian parents in a typical Brooklyn brownstone. This brownstone becomes the main point of contention between her belligerent parents. A father who longs to return to Barbados, and a mother who sees the ownership of the brownstone as the only true way of achieving the American dream. Using Selena's growing pains to capture the essence of the Afro-Caribbean immigrant experience, Paul Marshall became one of the first black female writers to reach wider recognition by tackling problems of race, gender, class, and cultural identity. Yet for Paul, this was a very personal book. It served in many ways as a rite of passage so I could move from my childhood, so I could take up my life and move forward, she later wrote. And move forward she did. After graduating from Brooklyn College in 1953, Paul started writing for a living. Her first job at Our World, a popular magazine for African-American readers, taught her discipline in writing and informed her on contemporary trends in black communities across the United States. In her capacity as staff travel journalist, she visited Brazil and the Caribbean islands, and there had some of her first experiences with black communities outside the United States. Her career as a journalist, however, was short-lived. In 1961, after publishing a collection of novellas titled Sold, Clap, Hand, and Sing, Paul was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and the following year received the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Now officially recognized, Paul's work caught the eye of Langston Hughes, and in 1965, he invited her to join him on his state-sponsored European tour. This experience had a major impact on her career as a writer. Under the wing of this giant of African-American literary canon, Paul developed a stronger sense for Pan-African identity and in the following years started looking for inspiration outside of the boundaries of her individual experience, from West Africa to South America, the West Indies to the Southern United States. Her stories drew their power from the histories of people spread across three different continents, yet belonging to one cultural identity, one people divided by the ocean. When you walk along the Atlantic, you can hear a kind, and as it comes in, and a powerful waves, it's as if it's tearing itself apart. And you know, the, the whole ritual in Shiva 
is a, the Jewish ritual of mourning with the women, you know, sort of tear their clothes and so on. As I walked, the first time I walked along the Atlantic in Barbados, I said, this sea is sitting shiva for the, uh, for the tyranny that took place. This reinforced sense of self led Paul to become active in the civil rights movement and black nationalist movement of the 1960s. Yet equally important was her role in the black feminist movement as one of the first female writers to explore the role of a black woman in contemporary American society, Paul had a major influence on the wave of black female writers that emerged in the 1960s and 70s, including such names as Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, and Alice Walker. Traditionally in most fiction, men are the wheelers and dealers. They are the ones in whom power is invested, she wrote in 1979. I wanted to turn that around. I wanted women to be the centers of power, Virtually every book that Paul wrote in her long career featured a strong female character, a black woman deeply affected by both the limitations of her current condition as well as the long history of suffering of her people. Yet, a woman powerful enough to break through those limitations and find inner means for change and spiritual awakening. In 1992, at the age of 63, Paul received a MacArthur Fellowship. Paul Marshall is a writer of fiction who engages social issues without compromising the nuances of her powerfully realized characters, the Foundation concluded. In her intricately crafted novels, Marshall explores the theme of healing, the healing of divided selves, divided cultures, and a divided world. In her memoir, Triangular Road, published in 2009, Paul Marshall identified herself as a tripartite person, a woman equally defined by her African roots, Barbadian ancestry, and her upbringing here in Brooklyn, New York. And while Paul's mother never achieved the American dream of owning a brownstone in Brooklyn, her daughter's powerful writing opened those same brownstones to millions of people and shared that unique kitchen poetry of her childhood with the world.